Well, welcome everybody. We're gathered on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Warrenjeri to the north and the Bunurong to our south, and pay my respects to elders past, present, present and emerging, and any Indigenous people who have joined us tonight. We welcome everybody. Now tonight, we're covering the disciplines of design, engineering, physics and chem to explore the nexus of art, design and science. Everything coming together. Wearable fabrics, fabrics with little sensors, all sorts of things. So we have Dr. Leah Heiss, Dr. Nolene Byrne, Dr. Rajas Ramanathan and Dr. Lyndon Arnold, who've joined us to discuss fashionable science, wearables, functional textiles, and circular fashion. Now the MC tonight is going to be Renee Beale. Renee? She's a science communicator and cultural producer committed to increasing public education, awareness, and engagement in science. She has a particular interest in the combination of science, art, and design and how the expertise of many different disciplines can inform each other. She has a PhD in genetics, so she's sort of moving a bit away from that, but it's still there, relevant in the background. And she's led cultural programming at the Melbourne Connect Initiative, based at the University of Melbourne. She joined the Royal Society last year as Victorian Science Week lead, and she did a fantastic job and we're hoping she'll do that again if she's still got the energy. And she's been helping us and many others to bring some spectacular science events around all around communities in the state. So please welcome Renee, and she's going to take over to be MC for the rest of the time. My goodness, I didn't expect a full introduction. Thanks, Nick. So tonight we're going to talk about fashionable science. Um, the 18th century English novelist um, Henry Fielding once said, fashion is the science of appearance. But I think it could equally be said that fashion requires science for its very appearance, or rather that science needs fashion for the sake of our appearance. So now more than any other time throughout history, consumers are demanding more than just style and fit from their clothing and more than just function from their wearable tech. For today's climate and demands, we need great looking textiles which more effectively protect, support, and enhance the wearer. Easy care fabrics, which fit our busy lifestyles, ethical fashion with low environmental impacts, and wearables, which not only monitor medical conditions, but also themselves desirable pieces of jewellery. So tonight, through our wonderful pan guest um, experts, we're going to explore topics such as recycling um, solutions, circular fashion, the creation of functional textiles for protection and performance. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speakers for this evening's fashionable science discussion. So our first speaker for this evening is Dr. Leah Heiss. Leah is a Melbourne-based artist and design, designer who has won five Good Design Awards. Her current projects include new forms for hearing technologies, biosignal sensing jewellery, emergency jewellery for times of crisis and ongoing experimentation with next generation materials such as magnetic fluids or liquids, memory um, metals and electricity conducting textiles. So that's quite a research interest. Um, so one of the first times I met Leah, we were working on a project that had to do with uh, future health. Um, and at this event, we, we were looking at some prototypes um, for a new swallowable pill, um, which contained sensors to sense the um, gases in, in the gut. The pill was blue and white, and it contained the name of the technology on the pill. After a while, Leah turned to me and said, no one's gonna wanna swallow that pill. Not with a font like that. <laughs> 
And this was when I firstly realised I had no clue about good design. And secondly, I realised that good design is actually crucial in assisting new medical technologies to be embraced rather than feared. So for more on good design, please welcome Leah Heiss. That is actually true. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I'd forgotten that I said that. Um, so thank you very much for that introduction and uh, for inviting me to speak today. So my name's Leah Heiss. I'm a designer and a researcher at RMIT. I'm in the School of Design and I collaborate widely across uh, engineering, advanced textiles, sciences, nanotechnologies. So I think the reason that you've invited me to speak today is that um, I have a really strong commitment to making wearable health technologies look better um, so that people want to use them and want to embrace them and we get around that sticky issue of compliance. So my research and practice is focused on designing wearable health technologies, experiences and services that aim to improve or save life. Uh, I, as Renee introduced, I do a lot of work also in this sort of experimentation with nano-engineered materials and textiles. So working with, say, magnetic liquids, um, shape memory metals, electroconductive textiles, all number of different types of materials. The interesting thing about working in this way is that uh, you can't prototype something that you're going to make out of magnetic liquid with balsa wood, you actually have to experiment with the material itself. And so I think about this idea of empathy and material empathy, that it, you actually need to work with materials in order to understand their properties and to do good things with them. So a lot of the work that I do is about sort of combining the medical and the personal. And when I was um, catching the bus here on the very hot day, I just thought I'd write down a few words that I think of and that are used quite commonly when people think about uh, medical technologies. And these are things like compliance, regulation, cleanliness, sanitation, clinical. You know, it's got to be beige, it's got to be grey, it's got to be cleanable. Um, it has to be easy to monitor, easy to put on, easy to take off, it has to be safe. Uh, but, you know, on the other side, we think about things that we actually really love to put on every day, like, um, you know, I love this watch, not because it tells me the time, but I like it because it looks like a piece of jewellery, and it's the best watch that Swatch has made for the last 10 years. It's got a bigger face than normal, it's really colourful, it goes with all of my bangles and my earrings, and it goes with my garments, you know, which are very colourful at the moment. So the, the kinds of words that we might use to talk about things that we actually love and cherish are, you know, personal, intimate, fashionable, beautiful, desirable. Um, so there's been this big sort of rift between the medical and the personal and it's been a little bit embarrassing to say that you want to make medical devices look beautiful. Like it's beauty, you're like, sorry, this is a hospital, we don't do beauty here. But I feel like, you know, things like this tonight, we can start to talk about actually there's a role for making things look beautiful. And it's not beauty for the sake of beauty, it's beauty because aesthetically desirable things are things that we want to integrate into our life. Things that, that actually um, feel like they're part of our identity. And I just wanted to bring this quote up before I go into, I'm going to talk about three projects, which I sort of consciously bring together the medical and the aesthetic. And this is from Susan Conn, who is a really extraordinary uh, Melbourne jeweller. And she says, a primary role of jewellery is to imply that a wearer has an active inner life kept as a secret. Wearing the object becomes a way of preserving this secret, but also a provocation for the viewer to break its codes to make the jewellery talk. So a lot of the work that I do, including, it's really bright, but there's a ring in there somewhere. <laughs> so a lot of my photography is really, is really light, unfortunately. Um, so a lot of the work that I do looks like jewellery, but is also a drug delivery or a monitoring device. And this is intentional. So this is about saying, I have something and it, the agency has given back to me to declare whether or not it's a drug delivery or monitoring device. So it just looks like a piece of contemporary jewellery and you can just read that as, as what it is. Um, and there's also this other thing that happens where if I'm wearing one of these things and somebody else is wearing one and they're both pieces of contemporary jewellery but they're also drug delivery devices, we start to develop interesting communities. Um, so the first project, it's, can you see a patch in there? Right, okay, from here I can only see a white cloud. Um, yeah, so um, about 10 years ago I was embedded in nanotechnology Victoria for a year and I was looking at, they had about 40 nano-engineered materials. Um, they were set up to commercialise the IP from the five, from five major universities that was being developed around nanotechnologies. And I was really interested in the, the uh, drug delivery and diagnostic technologies that they were working on. 
So they developed this incredible little patch, beautiful patch, 10 millimetres across, 2 millimetres thick, uh, between 1 and 10,000 nano um, needles on its surface, so tiny nanoscale needles. And the patch could administer insulin through the skin. It was a nanostructured insulin, so it could go through the dermis. In order to go through the dermis, it needed to be applied to the skin with some force. And so they had um, got a really great, some people might have heard the story, but they'd got a great engineering company to design an applicator. And the applicator came in a big um, metal box and it was, it was blue and it had a big red button on it and it looked like a rocket launcher. <laughs> and so I said to them, do you think anyone's gonna trade a syringe that's that big for a rocket launcher in a suitcase? Like, you know, really, you know, so there's a um, really great job, though, and it fires at exactly the same velocity 10,000 10, times in a row. That's awesome. However, like, as a person who is feeling stigmatised already and has to go to the bathroom to inject, I'm like, I'm probably not going to take my suitcase with me. And um, so that started this really interesting conversation because they were nanotechnologists. They were like, but it's an amazing technology. We've been at the bench for 10 years. And I'm like, yes, yes. However, if you want Mary to use that, you're going to have to come up with a better way of her using it. And so this started this really interesting conversation about could it be smaller, could it be smaller, could it be neater, could it be tidier, you know, could it be jewellery? And so I designed this, um, this was the, a necklace which was actually uh, uh, the drug delivery device to apply the patch to the skin and the ring held it in place once it was on the body. Um, and what this did for the nanotechnologists was that it enabled them to have this translation device. So all of a sudden, people said, oh, nano is really small and I can't understand it. But they went, jewellery? Oh, I get jewellery. And so they took it to, you know, bio, Europe, big conferences, and people were like, oh, jewellery, that's really interesting. I kind of get that. And so it was a really interesting cultural shift for them in terms of how do you translate hard science to a public that are actually, they'd like to engage, but, yep. There's a step to go. So that's one experience. The second one I wanted to talk about briefly is um, I worked with an amazing group of weavers, engineers, um, and production people to design, this is called the Smart Heart, and it's necklace, a necklace to replace the cardiac halter monitor for people who've had arrhythmia or a heart attack. Really interesting because the original technology, that little, that little dot on the side there, um, anyone who's had cardiac monitoring knows that it's, you know, you need to stick these, the 6 to 12 ECG sensors, um, a clunky thing that's like a 1980s pager that you have to wear for 24 to 48 hours, really hard to sleep in because there's all the cables hanging off you and, you know, and so it gets fitted in a hospital and you're sent home to 24 to 48 hours. And if the incident doesn't occur, you know, the PQRST wave doesn't show that there's been an incident in that period of time, then you're declared to be, well, we'll do some more monitoring or maybe you don't have the problem that you think you've got. So we were looking at long wear devices, particularly for spaces like aged care or people that are living at home and that need monitoring for about 10 to 14 days. And you could wear a device, so wear a necklace every day and take it off at night time to recharge. Um, so a really interesting sort of shift the really nice thing about this project was that it brought together weaving and engineering. And um, weavers and engineers don't hang out at the same clubs, I found. <laughs> and that was a really wonderful thing. So it was part of my PhD was actually, again, coming back to translation, what are the language forms of these two disciplines and how can we help them to understand each other's languages? And I ended up developing a whole lot of kind of um, scaled plans that, the, that would enable the weaving knowledge to be translated into engineering knowledge and the engineering knowledge to be translated back into weaving knowledge. So they could both read the plans and they could, from it, deduct sensor locations or pa uh, wiring pathways or picks per inch, if you're a weaver, picks per inch and warp and weft and where things are going. So it was a really interesting kind of um, collaboration over a number of years. Um, and the outcome was something that was very sort of intimate and, um, and sort of discreet, something that you could wear. So it, the big challenge technically was how do you uh, detect ECG at the back of the neck? And so that was sort of you know, a big part of the project. My most recent big project is FACET, which I designed for Blamey Saunders Hears. And they're a um, profit for purpose hearing aid company in, 
East Melbourne, not far from here. And so FACET is the world's first self-fit modular hearing aid. So it basically tries to do away with disposable batteries, which are incredibly challenging for people with arthritis or tactile insensitivity or vision impairment to change, or normal humans that have full tactile ability. <laughs> yeah. We were making a film about this and we gave it to a filmmaker who was very able and said, can you change the batteries? And she was like, I don't know. Even getting the little tiny batteries out of the blister packs, you know, the whole thing is just really awkward and fiddly and can be dangerous if there's pets or children around. So um, facet, the bit on the left is the battery, the bit on the right is the smarts. They just click together, it's very easy. So we have people with vision impairment using them. So where does fashion come into this project? Well, I spent a lot of time in the mineralogy collection at the Melbourne Museum, because one of the central tenets of my practice is that in order to shift the stigma of medical technologies, you need to go wide and seek inspiration outside the frame. So I spent a lot of time in the mineralogy collection. I spent a lot of time looking at bones and picking seeds off trees and collecting little bits of nuts and bones and, and seeds. And so all of my technologies are based on um, natural forms. And so that's about, actually, it's about fashion in some ways. It's about saying we have things that we like or that uh, reflect our identity, like um, a, a particular shape or size of phone, a particular shape or size of this or that, or my computer is this scale. And this is a suite of technologies. And I want to integrate something into that so that it's part of your identity already and there's not that big boundary. But it was, yeah, it was really well received last year, as you said. Thanks, Leah. Our second speaker for this evening is Dr. Rajesh Ram Ramanathan. <laughs> Sorry, I knew I was going to mess that up. It's a, uh, Rajesh is a, a senior research fellow at RMIT he has a cross-disciplinary uh, cross expertise that spans the physical sciences, biological sciences, engineering and statistics. His current research, just a few disciplines, his current research has a strong focus on the development of new nanomaterials for biosensor technologies with commercial potential. I came across Raj's research on a day when I had a gigantic pile of washing in my laundry. Raj has recently developed some nano-enhanced textiles that spontaneously clean themselves, the stains off them, um, by simply putting them under sunlight or um, even a light bulb. That day, I really wished that I had a whole wardrobe of Raj's technology. Please welcome Raj to tell us more about his nano-enhanced textiles. Thank you, Rennie. And uh, I accept with Leah, um, we need to have a chat because we develop a lot of technologies in our lab, but getting them out of the lab to the market is always the biggest challenge that I face. Uh, or I think most scientists will agree um, that's the biggest challenge because you can make things work, but to make things look good and appealing to the masses, is actually the part that we actually forget. And sometimes it happens a bit later, but sometimes it does happen early in research. This is just a, a quick uh, journey of what we do, how we do things. Nanotechnology in textile is actually not a new concept, if you look at it. I've given some few examples which I found really interesting when I was researching this myself. There is actually an emotion sensing dress, which I didn't know. Apparently, it was highlighted in the Paris week last year or year before. And apparently, depending on the mood that you have, it will change color. That's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to wear a black shirt and I'm going to turn red. Mm, I don't know. And then there was this technology by Black Heart Peace. I don't know how many of you listen to Black Heart Peace. But apparently, he was wearing a, a T-shirt, which had light bulbs on it, and it lit without any electrical um, signals going to it. Based on his motion, it had materials in there which could generate electricity, and it lit up. That's great. Then there was this shark skin suit, uh, which was used, I think, in the last Olympics. And Speedo actually developed, or not Speedo developed, but Speedo marketed it. Someone else developed it. They incorporated graphene into these suits. And one of the interesting properties of graphene 
is that it's hydrophobic. It hates water. So what it did was it allowed the swimmer to actually glide in the water to pick up speed, which was quite interesting. And we have antibacterial textiles as well, right? Um, I think that's very common uh, in terms of textile technology because silver has been used for a million of years for having antibacterial properties, but to incorporate them into textiles was an ingenious idea, whoever came up with that. And now we have a product in the market, Acticoat. They market this as um, one of the most leading products with silver nanoparticles embedded within their matrix. And the interesting part about this uh, thing is that it has a very broad range of antibacterial property, which is what excites me. And I'll tell you why. So where, why did we move to textile and why nanomaterials and things like that? Nanomaterials impart interesting functionalities, as we saw in the last slide. But one of the properties that we wanted to incorporate into our textiles was photoactivity. Why? A simple reason. If I have to have generate an electrical signal, then put that in, in your clothing, not, not fun. But if I use light, <laughs> And I say, I'm just going to shine light. It's going to clean your clothes. Or if you have a wound, it's going to heal your wound. You're interested straight away. That was the reason why we chose this. And when you look at light, light is also quite complex, right? So you have your UV region, you have your visible region, and your infrared region. Okay. The basic difference, UV causes cancer, can't use. Visible, great. Infrared, even better. You know why? Because 53% of the sunlight that we get is infrared. That's what causes the heat. And you all know what happened outside today, right? It was hot. So we started developing materials which will actually use the visible and infrared region, and for two different purposes. But the challenge for us was, OK, we have this concept in our head. But we want to execute that. And so we said, OK, let's look at textile, te like using textiles or fabrics, because they're readily available, cheap, and all of us need fabric. So we're like, OK. But there are challenges. And the challenges were it needs to be easy to fabricate so that if we ever go commercial, we should be able to put that in with existing technologies. And it should impart some beneficial properties. So the challenge was, first try and put the material on the fabric. It's not as easy as you think, because as soon as you put the material and you wash it, it goes away. Not helpful, not helpful, <laughs> right? So we wanted to get some interesting things so that it won't go away with washes. It won't go away that easily, at least. So that was the biggest challenge. And we overcome. It took us about three, four years of work. But we came up with new strategies to put nanomaterials on fabric, which will not go off as easily as you think. You could wash it in your washing machine, and it doesn't go. We tried. And it all started with actually a serendipitous discovery. You know, we call it necessity is a mother of invention. That was true. I was trying to make something else, and I made something else. <laughs> and it took me more than a year and a half to figure out, oh, it was this, not that. I was like, oh. But what we actually did was we actually put some um, organic semiconductors on a piece of fabric. It was great because now I had a fabric which was flexible, but it had electronic properties. I could use it to store information. I could use it to transmit information, which was great, and use that. What we did was we developed these three kind of materials. It's a very small part of the fabric. The whole fabric looks different. Um, but we started developing a variable sensor. And I was thinking, what can we use it as a variable sensor? I worked in a lab. I was like, we have oxygen monitors, NOx monitors, hydrogen monitors, and whatnot. I was like, how about incorporating that with a piece of fabric? What if it sent you a signal saying, this room is low in oxygen. Get out. Great. <laughs> so that's what we were trying to do. And we tried 
We made two different sensors based on the material that we used. Either it detected NOx, which is quite common, or hydrogen, which is again quite common, in labs, in industrial processes, right? So this was interesting, great, but the journey didn't stop there. This was actually a side part of something else we were trying to develop. Again, the same thing, right? We were trying to develop a textile technology which will have wood healing properties. And what we found was it was self-cleaning as well. <laughs> okay. So what we did, we put small amount of copper and silver, a different kind of copper and silver that you see in the normal market. And what it could do is when you shine visible light, it will get excited. No? Like summer, when we see after a long, enduring winter, when we see the summer sun, we are all excited with our beach clothes on the beach. Same way. So they get excited, and what happens? You have stains on your clothing. This excited nanomaterial, it develops small molecules which will break these down. And when I proposed this idea, and we were talking to the news crew, they were like, oh, it can take dust off too. I was like, no, it doesn't. Dust is inorganic. It will take care of an organic strain, not an inorganic state. Okay. Um, I think there was an ad. I don't know if it comes in Australia. I don't watch that much TV, sorry. Um, there is a technology with soaps where you see these oxygen bubbles coming up. You know? It's similar, but rather than using a soap, we use nanomaterial. And we put that in part, that same property into your thoughts, right? These are just technical jargon, but we made, because we made two different kind of materials, uh, we had one particular problem. You see that? After a few washes, it was going away. We had to fix that, okay? So this is much more recent. We're still developing this. And what now you see is it doesn't lose even after 15, 30, 45, 50 washes. Okay. We have to do some extensive testing, which we are doing with PVH Corp as well, and trying to make sure that these nanoparticles do not escape your clothing that easily. My last example for the day is wound management. This is why we started the project. From, right from the, my career start, I was very interested in developing biomedical <laughs> technologies. That's why I got into this. My mom is diabetic, and I'm always worried about the fact there is a statistic saying one in three people in the world get their legs amputated because of diabetes. And why? It's because you have wounds that do not heal. They're called chronic wounds. In Australia, let's not worry about just diabetes. In Australia, they're saying that this is a new global epidemic and we spend about 2% of our total medical budget on just treating such wounds. That's a huge, huge amount of money that we spend. Economic is one part, but the pain that people go through when they have chronic wound is not fun. When reading the literature, we came up with this new thing. We, we saw that in the 1980s, people were using something called electrical stimulation therapy. What happens, why, why does the body not heal the wound when it knows there is a wound? Because it doesn't know there is a wound. So what do you do? When you have a wound, the body sends electrical signals to your brain, and that's what triggers the brain to send the cells out there to heal the wound. But when that system doesn't work, it's going to lead to a chronic wound. And what they did in this therapy was quite interesting. They took two pieces of electrode, which is basically two metal bars, and stuck it in where the wound was, in your leg. So already you are in pain, but I'm gonna enjoy giving you more pain, right? So it was not fun for the patient, okay? So, well, they could say, oh, we'll put that in once and not worry about it. Not that easy, it's a metal surface, right? It's going to grow bacteria on it. That is not going to help give any electrical stimulation. So although the therapy was successful, it didn't ever make it to the market. There were a few papers on it, and that's about it. 
we said, okay, that sounds interesting because I have a nanomaterial which can absorb infrared light and do the same job, you know? And that's what we made here. So that piece of fabric that you see in the red color is the material. And what that material does is it absorbs infrared light and does a few things. One, kills whatever bacteria that you throw at it. You see these ads for Dettol, it says it kills 99% of germs. What does that mean? If you have 100, it will kill 99 of them. There's still one remaining, and that's good enough to create a havoc. Okay? Mm -hmm. And when I say this is, works really great, I mean it kills 99.999999% of bacteria that you throw at it. Okay? So, which means that if you have one million bacteria, I don't think anything survives in a lot of cases. And then we were interested to know how it kills. Well, body, will, will the bacteria adopt or adapt to this technology? No, it can't, it's not going to be that easy for the bacteria because the way your body fights bacteria naturally, that's how this kills as well. It's called ROS. That's how we age. That's how your body takes care of things. Produces something called reactive oxygen species in your body, which kills bad stuff. That's how it does it. Then, this is where it starts getting really interesting. What you see here is, this is a visible light and this is an infrared light. I'm generating really small amount of current. Good enough for the body to say, oh, there is a problem, I need to go fix it. To validate this, we first did it in the laboratory, like this is called a scratch assay, where you can see we create a scratch. In six hours, you can see that the scratch is starting to get filled, which was great. We had, so now we have something that is able to heal wounds and show antibacterial. So Acticord was able to protect the wound from bacterial growth, but not heal the wound. And what we saw was, you see here, so in, we said we have great results in the lab, so we would take it to the mice. We took it to mice, created a wound, and said, let's see what it does. Well, bacteria didn't survive. There was not a, um, any surprises there. But what we saw was when we shine infrared light, you see the wound healing there. This is actually Acticot. Acticot didn't do any wound healing, but what we now have is a simple technology which will not just kill bacteria, but it will help in wound management. Here are some of the interesting examples that I showed you that we do. There is a few more examples, but I didn't want to overwhelm. Um, we do work a fair bit on sensors. We are developing <coughs> glucose sensors, uh, which where, again, you embed nanoparticles, and you just pee on it, rather than injecting for um, taking blood out, you can just pee on it and it will tell you what your glucose levels are. It was as simple as that. And why we wanted to do it is because you can damage your kidney when you have diabetes. And blood glucose, although it's a good indicator of glucose, not always for people who've had diabetes for a long time. So this actually helps. And so whatever I presented today was not just my own work. The whole team uh, is involved in different aspects and a lot of funding from different funding bodies as well. And I would particularly like to mention the, the self-cleaning and the wound management. Um, we went to Index Awards where we met the CEO and they really want us to take that to the market. So that's why we're, like, we're slowly moving towards this commercial aspect. And I was just talking to Leah before we started saying, we need to talk, we need to talk. <laughs> And thank you all for listening. Thanks, Raj. Our third speaker this evening is Dr. Nolene Byrne. Nolene is a senior lecturer at Deakin University. Her research and teaching interests center on understanding process structure, property relationships in polymers. She is particularly interested in circularity and how sustainability and value can be added, uh, can be added to waste by um, innovative processing, material design and product development. 
Nolene was a member of the H&M Global Change Award in 2017 for her denim recycling technology. I think that it's fair to say that awareness is building in Australia around the incredible amount of water en and energy used uh, and waste as well produced by the fast fashion industry. I was so pleased to come across Nolene's research as a local solution to a global problem. As with many um, plastic recycling technologies and solutions, the trick is to produce recycled products which will actually be used um, and for something that's, that's actually going to ensure the circularity um, is achieved. Nolene's new denim um, recycling technology certainly achieves this and actually in a, in a very novel way, so I'm excited to hear that about that. Um, so to tell us more about her technologies and some other research that she's doing, Nolene Byrne. So thank you uh, for that um, introduction. Um, I'm pretty excited to come and share uh, what we're doing down at Deakin University Warren Ponds. Um, I'm within the Institute for Frontier Materials. Uh, so just to get us thinking about why is it that, we, that we're interested in circular textiles and making the textile industry a little more circular and a little more sustainable, I'm going to ask a question. Who has bought an item of clothing in the last month? Hands up. Okay. Right. Now, next question. <laughs> Who has thrown out an item of clothing in the rubbish bin recently or what did you last do with your last item of clothing? Did you throw it out? No. Your old pair of socks? <laughs> throw, th throw them in into, the, into the rubbish bin? Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> okay. Here's some shocking truths and some shocking facts about the textile industry. It happens to be the second biggest polluter worldwide. So why is that? There's a couple of reasons for that. There's the consumer side of things, so certainly perhaps fast fashion. And so now no longer are, do we have four fashion cycles, but we have closer to seven or eight fashion cycles um, per year. So we're consuming textiles to a greater rate. Um, there's also the population growth. So what's happening is we're, we're seeing a lot um, larger amounts of textile ending up in landfill. So we have that problem to deal with. There's also the problem associated, associated around with making the textiles. So the water use in growing the cotton, in dyeing the textiles. So dyeing is a, is a big consumer. And I don't know if anyone has seen the documentary The River Blue. If you have not, it is well worth watching. It's very powerful and it may make you reconsider the, the next colourful t-shirt you purchase. So these are the motivators as to why my team and, and the broader team down at the Institute started to get involved in trying to find solutions to, to these problems within the textile industry. Okay, so there's, we're doing a lot um, around circular textiles down at the Institute and I'm only going to give you a couple of examples that are specific to my team. And so what I want to do is I want to describe the general process that we're using to, to do these textile recycling um, uh, processes. So we take the textile waste and we typically turn it into a powder. So we shred it and we mill it. Now at this point, what we can do is we can take that, that powder, it's essentially a coloured pigment, and we can screen print and we can make coloured textiles. So this was the concept that we won the H&M award for, and they, if, how, good, how good's your eyesight? So this is us down here, denim dye denim. So we were essentially taking your old pair of denim jeans, we were powdering them, and we, was, we were creating a new pair of jeans. So this is a couple of us, of us dorky scientists um, <laughs> are receiving our awards, and each pair of those jeans we have created from old jeans using this type of technology. So we were very excited about that and it got us thinking about, well, what other things could we do um, towards trying to make circular textiles? So that was a mechanical solution 
and really in order to really recycle textiles and to bring it back to fibre and to perhaps make other products from it, we have to start to look at some chemical solutions. So we started to, um, to, to develop some chemical solutions. So now we take the powder, we do some magical pretreatment, which I will come back to. We put it into solution, so we dissolve it. And then once we have it in solution, we can make a variety of different things. So today I'm talking about cotton textile waste. So cotton, for those of you who don't know, is actually a cellulose type material. And cellulose is used for a variety of, a heap of different things, from bioscaffolds to drug deliveries in beads. We also can make regenerated um, textile fibres, so viscose fibre is, is an example of that. Uh, and cellophane is made from textiles. So food packaging, things like that, films can, can, come, from, can come from a cellulose source. So we kind of figured out that a waste cotton t-shirt is just a really great cellulose source. So let's do some really fun things with it. So these are the types of different things that we can do with our, with our cellulose. And today I just want to talk about the fibre research, so that's a truly closed loop, fibre to fibre stuff. And I also want to talk about the aerogels, because believe it or not, we are looking at them as replacement cartilage for your knees, which is kind of funky. Okay, so here is the fibre to fibre stuff. So the process, the textile waste, through to the dissolution, and then we use a wet spinning technique. Now, next time you're going shopping and you're looking at that colourful dress, versus that solid colour solid color dress. Think of me, because it's a lot easier to recycle solid colours. <laughs> okay, so we've been learning a lot in the lab about what happens with the colour when we're trying to create and we're trying to recycle uh, these textile fibres, because it's very important. I look around the room and there's, there's a lot of colour. We want to express ourselves through our textiles. So I'm learning, I'm, I'm a scientist. I have my, my SEM picture up there just to prove that I'm a geek and I'm a scientist. But I, I am appreciating that, that there's colour and we, we express ourselves through our clothing. So I'll put a couple of examples and sometimes I feel like I'm back in kindergarten because we're taking different coloured textile waste and we're mixing them together to see what colour we might be able to produce at the end. So if we have a look at, say, this um, red textile waste, we powder it. Then depending on how we pre-treat it, we can either spin a fibre and retain the colour, which is very important because we eliminate all of that energy and water required in dyeing. So it, we're actually making quite a sustainable process here. We can also decolour it. So this is important, particularly if we're working with mixed colours, or if our designers say, oh, well, that's great. I'm, I'm so happy that you can make an orange fibre from orange, but I really wanted to make that green. So we can produce a non-coloured fibre. And so we, we depending on our pre-treatment, we can produce a lot of different colours from, from different fabrics. So this is green. We pre-treat it a certain way and we get a lovely brown, or we can leave it green. So we're still learning here. Uh, this is very, very new technology. Um, there's not a lot of this technology out there, but this is truly, and we're very excited by it, this is truly fibre to fibre, uh, closed loop um, textile recycling. So the other example, and I'm gonna stick to time, is, well, so okay, fibre to fibre is great, and it's definitely what a lot of the brands want from us, but we're scientists and we want to do more fun things. With, with, our, with our products. So we started to think, well, what, what value-added products could we create from our textile waste? So remembering that once we're in solution, once we're in that dis dissolved state, we are just essentially producing a cellulose product. So we started to look at aerogels. So aerogels are a high surface area, porous, the, the, the nanopores, they're used a lot in filtration. We can tune the pore size. They're used a lot in absorption. And because these ones are made from cellulose, they're also excellent bioscaffolds. So a colleague within, within the institute saw some of our morphologies, saw some of our 
SEM images. I'm a scientist, proven. Um, and said, oh, oh that, they look really interesting. And that isotropic pore formation that you get out of these, um, these waste denim would really suit a, um, a cartilage. So we've just started to do some, some friction measurements. And yes, indeed, they perform very well as a cartilage. Now, what happens, the aerogels that we get from the waste textiles, they have a slightly different property to what you get if you use other cellulose sources. And this comes back to the molecular weight or the length of the polymer chains in the cotton. It's very, very high compared to other celluloses. So we can do some funky stuff that you can't do with, say, wood pulp, for example. So that's quite exciting. And so on that, I just want to say that I don't do this alone. And uh, this is my team at IFM. So a couple of postdocs, and most of the work is done by my very smart PhD students. Thank you. Thanks, Nolene. So our final speaker for this evening is uh, Dr. Lyndon Arnold. Lyndon is a research physicist with over 45 years experience. He has worked in textiles for 18 and a half years at CSIRO, plus another 12 and a half years at RMIT. Dr. Arnold is, has accumulated extensive experimental and theoretical experience in the fields as diverse as acoustics and um, vibration, sound propagation, radar, atmospheric and stratospheric physics, general meteorology, geophysics, microseismics, fiber science and technology, protective fabrics and ballistic stab and blast protection. I had to add all that because I think that's amazing. <laughs> Um, his textile research has covered a broad range of fibre properties, textile production and fabric performance. His recent textile and um, fibre research includes the development of patented fibre blend um, ballistic fabrics for protection against high speed projectiles and protective fabrics to mitigate the effects of high speed impacts from blast debris. When I first spoke to Lyndon, he said to me that never before had his research been referred to as fashionable <laughs> science. Um, and so here to tell you about his not so fashionable science is Dr. Lyndon Arnold. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I belong to a protection racket. If you've got a protection problem, I can get myself and my boys and my girls to come over and sort it out for you. <laughs> to give you some idea what sort of experience we have in providing protection, you can look, first of all, at the situation of firefighters. We're talking about fashionable science. Okay? Fashionable science is not just about catwalks. Obviously, if you're a firefighter, your major concern is to protect yourself from fire. <coughs> Fire, radiation and sparks. That sort of goes without saying. The problem is that most of the outerwear that is used for firefighters these days is made out of materials which are UV degraded. And when I say UV degraded, you take these outer materials out in the sun and over a period of about three months, their strength will be reduced to 20%. Not by 20%, reduced to 20% of its original strength. And therefore, its performance as a fire protection is also degraded. The question you have to ask is, for 35,000 CFA firefighters who are standing out in the sun in the middle of summer fighting fires, how often do you have to replace their gear, bearing in mind that it probably costs about $1,000. This is not about fashion. This is about survival. And if you think in terms of either CFA firefighters who basically work out in the field, or MFB firefighters who do, do basically structural firefighting, they do a lot of physical work. 
And one of the problems that they then have, especially with these new materials that they use for the outerwear, is that they produce a lot of internal heat and they overheat and they drop because of heart failure and strokes and all those sorts of things. So fire is not the problem. Quite often structural firefighters will go to places where they shouldn't and then they fall over or get lost in the smoke and people have got to go and rescue them. And firefighters these days don't just fight fires, they also do a lot of rescue. And they're out on the roads picking up bodies in the rain and the drizzle in the middle of the night and cars are whizzing pie. And so the important thing is that they be seen. And you've got to think that, OK, where are they in the dark or through the smoke? Reflect on the dangers. OK, you put reflective tapes and things on there. They themselves have got to be fire retardant. The yarns you use to stitch all this together have got to be fire retardant. What happens if you use metal zips and you can't unzip them because they're too hot? What happens if you use zips that are made out of nylon that happen to melt? There is a lot of science involved in that. It's not a case of looking pretty. We did some work for the railways, and it looks trivial. What colour reflective safety gear should a railway worker wear? We have here a specific example because, as I say, what should the train driver see? Trains have a horrible, horrible habit only going in one direction. They can't duck and weave. So the train driver has got to decide what he sees in front of him is something he should stop for. And you may think it's just the worker on the, on the line or the worker up the pole or the 500 passengers behind him. It is not a case of looking pretty. It's a case of survival. We've talked about two situations here where people have got to survive, to be seen to survive. OK, what about combat soldiers? If you can see them, you can kill them. You have the reverse problem. There's his head. There's the gun. There's his leg. For him, survival is not to be seen. And those are all scientific type studies that you have to consider. Carry on this theme about combat soldiers. Vests and pants help convicts uh, con, uh, combat survival. And here we have a typical soldier on the left-hand side there, and there's his outer gear, and here is his ballistic vest, which probably has 28, 32 layers. And down there is his undies. Now, he might have 22, 28, 32 layers here, but he's only got one layer there. We first got into protective textiles at RMIT with the problem about the outer vests, the ballistic vests here, because a lot of those vests are made out of something like Kevlar. Now, Kevlar is really beautiful because it's really strong. It's also bright yellow. OK, you can get different versions of it, but yeah, basically bright yellow. The other problem with it is it's UV degraded. There is a law now, I think, universal, that whether you use it or not, every two years a ballistic vest will be thrown out and replaced with a new one. Because again, like the outer gear for the firefighters, UV, whether it's exposed or not, could <coughs> degrade its performance. And one of the things about Kevlar in particular is it's got a very low surface friction. And so from the point of view of a combat soldier, if you have 28 or 32 layers, but you have a very sharp nosed bullet coming in, the bullet can hit, hit the fabric and spread it wide and sneak through between the yards. Now, the way you stop a bullet is by forcing the bullet to break yards. If it doesn't break yards, you're not stopping it. It's made worse if that fabric gets wet. The surface friction goes down. Stronger fashion vests, wet or dry. If they're wet, simple solution, add wool. I had a patent on that. It's counterintuitive. Why would you add a fibre which is weak to a very, very strong fibre? The wool doesn't stop the bullet. The wool makes the Kevlar work better. It also absorbs water. And up the top here, 
this is opened up, these two pages here are opened up like a book, where this is one of the earlier pages, and that's the page at which the bullet stopped. And the next slide shows the bullet being taken out, turned over, so you see the other side of it. And that's the indentation into that, uh, into that fabric layer and all the fabric layers behind it. And if you look very closely at that, you'll see that that bullet has the indentation, the pattern of the fabric on it. That's how hot it gets. Now, that bullet is designed to be essentially a dum-dum. It's designed to come in nice small hole at the, start, at the front and a dirty great big hole at the back. You're dead. Sometimes it's far better to be shot at by an armor-piercing bullet that doesn't deform. It'll go straight through. Now, if you're lucky, it might go straight through somewhere which doesn't kill you. Misses the heart. OK, so Ned Kelly had a problem below the waist, as I pointed out. We still have. Because one of the things about a combat soldier is he's not always spending his time running away, but he's spending a lot of time running. And one of the big problems with, with ballistic vests, the upper bit, is there is no protection for the arms, or very little. There's very little protection around the neck, and there's no protection below the waist. What about landmines and IEDs? IEDs are improvised explosive devices where people put things, nasty things, explosives in holes, maybe with a few chemicals added to it, bacteria and a few other bits and pieces, fertilisers, all sorts of fun things. How do you protect below the waist? What can you do to help a soldier survive? Now, we basically accept that the soldier, if he stands on a landmine, he will lose his legs. I say, pants and undies, fashion with extra bang. The bang is the landmine. Let's keep it clean. And I'm not talking about genitals. I'm talking about let's keep the wound as clean as we can possibly keep it, knowing that very likely they will die of one of two things, infection or blood loss. We are more concerned about the femoral arteries than we are about the crown jewels. If the femoral arteries are cut, they've got probably less than two minutes to save his life. This is not about fashion. This is about survival. Fashion is only skin deep. Phrases go right to the bone. I'd like to pay a tribute to a friend. Matthew Thompson, because he walked into us one day and he said, I fell off my bike and I got horrendous industry, injuries. Can you do something about the cycling gear? OK, he set up some criteria. It had to be slinky. It had to be diable. It had to perform exactly the way the normal cycling gear performed when you bought it off the shelf. It had to have, have it so that you could put logos on the outside. Appearance is everything, OK? Performance is never a consideration. Appearance, fashion. Just have a look at some of these injuries. Look at this one. Uh, that's not bitumen, that's blood. Tour de France. We know of two cyclists in the Tour de France, and you know how fast they go ran into barbed wire fences. We tested these sorts of materials for abrasion. The criteria that he wanted was something that would work exactly the way common fabrics and cycling gear already works, with the one proviso that it had to have improved abrasion performance. And we were just aiming to reduce the level of injury by one factor. There are five factors usually in a medical assessment. So it doesn't stop you breaking your arm or a collarbone, OK? But we're saying, like before, let's keep it clean. Because the major problem they have is, once you've taken all the skin off and it goes down to the bone, infection is the big problem. That's why cyclists, of course, shave their legs. They don't want stuff in the wound. Appearance and performance are everything. Fashion, fashion, fashion. But what happens when you crash? 
when we measured some of these common fabrics, we were getting a failure at 0.1 of a second. You hit the ground, it's gone. The rest of it is your skin right across the road. We came up with some fabrics, a suite of fabrics, which were 100 times better than what was on the market. And in some cases, a thousand times better. Slinky, where were the braids of flair? Yes, and it was his quote, I've changed the number, he said 10 years. An eight year overnight success in his words. It took us three years to come up with this suite of fabrics and the rest of the time was getting it commercialized. And in my 50 year career, that is the only commercial outcome I have gained to this point. A last, a career justified. <laughs> now, that's not to say I haven't come up with all sorts of beautiful collective uh, inventions, but it's always money and politics that stop it from going anywhere. Thanks, Lyndon. What I might do now is we're going to have a really quick Q&A because I know everyone's been holding their questions until the end. We talked a lot about antibacterials, antimicrobial uh, bacterials, and I was interested in knowing about uh, the silver nanoparticles. It's all about silver nanoparticles. So I think it's Sorry. our second speaker. Yeah. Raj. Yep. Yeah. Raj, easier. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about the uh, antimicrobial properties of silver nanoparticles. I wanted mm -hmm. to know if it was the same for other noble metals like gold, platinum. Uh, gold and platinum we've tested, but they don't kill bacteria with the same efficiency as silver. Silver basically comes off like generally with just silver-based products. They come out as silver ions. Uh, silver ions are, are pretty well known. They'll kill. Uh, gold ions would do the same job, but once you make a gold nanoparticle, it will not go to the ionic state that easily because they are noble metals. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to ask a general question about clothing recycling. So if, if I have a bag of clothing and I take it to somebody who purports to you know, want used clothing, what generally happens to it? I mean, is it reused, recycled, or, 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 or what? I mean, I see things in op shops, but uh, the stuff that, that you generally winds up in an op shop, it, you know, before it gets there is usually immaculate, has no holes, no darns, no nothing. Um, most things, when they're thrown out, will be worn. So that's a good question. Um, approximately 15% of our clothing is collected and reused. And so depending on the quality of that clothing, some of it goes back to charities, some of it is downcycled into rags um, or put into mattresses, etc. The majority of it does, even if you put it into a collection bin, for example, if the quality is too poor to be reused or, or um, given to a charity, it will be incinerated or sent to the landfill. Hi, this is a question for Raj. Um, regarding the antibacterial um, abilities, how does it determine what's good antibacterial, I mean, what's good bacteria and what's bad bacteria? Um, so in most cases, because we're dealing with wounds, the stuff on the surface is generally bad bacteria. Um, so we are more interested because they, you have to worry about good and bad bacteria if you're going to put it inside the body. Uh, outside the body in a hospital environment, I don't think you're going to get any good bacteria in there, I hope. Um, but uh, basically, it, it, doesn't, it, it will not differentiate between good and bad. It will just kill anything on its path. I just wanted to ask um, about recycling clothes. How do you do it on a mass scale? So you're only doing it in a, in a laboratory at the moment, and I know you work with H&M. Um, how do you do that, and how, how are we going to affect change? Yeah, so actually we're already semi-pilot. So down at Deakin, we're pretty unique. We have the only semi-pilot wet spinning line in Australasia. So we have tested our technology um, at, at this capacity and at this scale. Yeah. Hi, my question is for Nolene as well. Um, you alluded uh, during your talk to some of the cool things that you can do with the longer chain, um, uh, you know, from cotton fibre. Would you be able to tell us some of the cool things? So, um, 
because cotton has a longer longer chain, um, high molecular weight or high degree of polymerisation, uh, we can we can create those aerogels with slightly different morphologies. So they they find specific uses in say cartilage um, applications where isotropic behaviour and properties is more important. If you're thinking about filtration, again, if you can create an isotropic type membrane, you can filter out different things. Um, so it just, it just opens up a, a different toolbox, I guess, by using the, the longer chain cellulose. Another question for Nolene. It sounds fascinating what you're doing. What hopes with poly, polyester fabrics being the yeah. most of our recycling stuff? So I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to hide away from the, from the blended materials. Um, the majority of our clothing items is a polycotton blend. Uh, we have a lab-based technology there. Uh, again, c keeping in line with our circular um, pillar down at IFM, we're trying to keep both the polyester and the cotton at the highest value throughout our, our technology. So we want to develop technology that doesn't overly degrade the polyester and doesn't degrade the cotton. So it's early days for us there, but um, stay tuned. Maybe I'll come back in 12 months or something and awesome. <laughs> I'll be able to report on, on our separation technology. Nolene, I know it's early days for the technology you're developing. How easily do you think it's going to scale? What's going to be required to scale it? Uh, so money. <laughs> <laughs> Partners, um, and, and just a lot around the sorting, which comes back to how we collect the textiles, um, because how we sort it is really going to be important, particularly in that ability to create the coloured fibres. If I can have all the same colours in, in, my, in my waste stream, then I'm going to be able to create the same coloured fibre. So there's a little bit of front end technology that's required as well. I um, also have a question for Nolene. Um, fibre to fibre. I'm glad I kept my talk short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The fibre to fibre sort of closed circle uh, you were talking about, does it degrade the more that it goes around in the circle or can it go on forever? So, good question again. There doesn't appear that the cellulose degrades or the cotton degrades significantly in wear. Uh, we have to degrade it a little bit or we have to reduce the molecular weight a little bit in our process. Uh, so I, th I, I think it's truly circular. And if we degrade it too much, we just top it up with some, some d different feedstock with a slightly higher molecular weight. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Raj, the technologies you're talking about, the fabrics that um, dirt falls off, those mm -hmm. sorts of things, um, we want our garments to last longer, so we're not recycling them as often. When is it going to be commonplace? Um, yeah, I've had this question a fair bit. Again, comes back to the same point. Um, it's to get research out of a university, commercialize it, is not the most easiest of tasks. Uh, a lot of hurdles when it comes to that. But um, we are working with PVH. I'm hoping like, they will push the project much faster um, because in Australia we bound by ARC which funds this kind of research. They have a particular pot of money which gets distributed so this like PVH is willing to throw millions of dollars which I don't think I can get through the ARC. So I think it's much more easy you develop the technology and then you license it so that it gets to the next stage and I, I believe that they there are a few companies that we're working with and they all want to get it to the market ASAP. I've got a question for all of you. Thank you. That was wonderful and so different from each of you. Um, I often teach wearable tech to students and it's a great hook to get them in and thinking about tech and sometimes kind of around the back door to getting them into science. If you could um, give a message to students based on your work, something that you wish that they knew or something that you think would spark their imagination, what would you say? Anyone? Basically, I would say, as I said to my nephew many years ago, they should do what they enjoy. I'm still working and I'm 72. <laughs> and I have no intention of retiring because I enjoy it too much. It keeps me alive. And 
If you go into something because you're bright and you become a doctor or you become a lawyer or something and you hate it, after 40 years of doing it, you're going to absolutely loathe it. So do something that you want to spend your life doing. That way you'll be happy. On that note, I think that's a beautiful note to finish on. So I'm going to hand over to Kevin orman Rossiter to do the vote of thanks for the speakers. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Renee for putting together such a great panel of speakers and um, <laughs> ideas for tonight because I don't know about you but there's not many places in the world probably where you've sat in one hall and heard what I've been reminded of as an ex-physicist and even ex-triathlete that the fashionable science of survival was important. I've been reminded of my sock recycling habits which I am um, going to be reconsidering my next choice of shirt because I'm probably going to worry about my cartilage from my triathlon days now. <laughs> um, but I have been fascinated by the, the textile photosensitivity. You know, I mean, self-cleaning clothes, that's really good because neither Sharon nor I are particularly good at the laundry side of things either. And I really, really like the idea of anybody who can get weavers and engineers to hang out together is really worth listening to. So I'd like you to thank all of our presenters for tonight's talk. Thank you.